Okay, so my name is Jill Moniz. I'd like to first just welcome you all here and I'll actually thank you for letting me be here with you on your campus today. I am the curator for the Grant Venerable Portrait at the Venerable House. And because um, a portrait tells a story and a story is deep and complex and um, often requires more than just the visual language. Uh, I wanted to extend that out and invite the Venerable family to talk with us and share their stories um, about what it means to call Caltech home. And so how this is going to work is, um, I hope you guys are going to engage with us here tonight. And the students, I want you to come and talk with the venerables about what it means for you to call the venerable house home and they will share with you and with us all uh, what it means for them and what growing up in their own home and thinking of caltech as a home as well um, has done for their lives and the legacy that we're all a part of here today so without further ado thomas hi uh, is this on? I don't no. know. Yeah. It was on. It's on now. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. My voice is pretty deep, so it, it carries normally. And you know, you, you put it on a mic, and there's some problems. So, as most of you know, I'm not actually a student at the the Venerable House um, because you guys all are <laughs> students at the Venerable House. Um, but at the same time, I do think that Venerable and what he's done has allowed me to find a place like home here at Caltech. So I'm a graduate student in my third year in neuroscience. Um, I'm going to hopefully be the, the first black neuroscientist to graduate with a graduate degree here. Um, and thank you, thank you. You know, I, I wanted to brag and make it a little bit about myself before I, you know, I started talking. Um, but I think that has obviously been something that's been difficult to kind of navigate. You know, I'm often the only black student in my classes. It's oftentimes the only black student that my professors have ever advised, and yet, it is infinitely easier because of the work that Grant Venerable has done to kind of make being black at Caltech something that's not foreign, something that's, I wouldn't say yet expected. You know, I still think that we, we have a lot of ways to go to kind of become more accepting of, of people of color, um, but it's not unique. You know, I'm not the first student at Caltech um, like their father was. Uh, there's a lot of administration that is really familiar with dealing with black students due to you know, the work that Grant Venerable has done, the, the work that his family has done, and black students a little bit older than me that have, you know, kind of come afterwards uh, and kind of made it a much more safe place, you know, to be an African-American here. And so for me, home is some place where I can feel accepted to be my true self, some place where I can feel like I can, I can do my science at the highest level without worrying about fitting in, without worrying about being respected, and a lot of those things kind of wouldn't have been able to be possible if it wasn't for the work that Grant Venerable has done. So thank you for allowing me to kind of kick things off. And you know, I want to hand it over to uh, the actual family themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Do you want me to open? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just making some notes. Uh, I was thinking of some of my father's connections and which I was thinking of it at the dinner. Uh, one was uh, a Dr. Lloyd Augustus Hall, who was the first, I guess, black pharmaceutical industrial chemist in the United States. He was born in 1894 in Elgin, Illinois. His grandparents migrated there on the Underground Railroad uh, where they escaped slavery in the South. And so he grew up in Elgin. There were not many black families in Northern Illinois, but it was a fortuitous uh, place for him. And that's, that's the, maybe the so-called dark underside of race in terms of its advantages that, doesn't, that don't get discussed. In other words, if you don't 
get knocked around a bit, you never get tough to deal with whatever challenges you're dealing with in the environment. And uh, Lloyd Hall went to high school. He did well enough to get into Northwestern University and got his bachelor's there. He did uh, his master's at the University of Chicago. Uh, but what happened there in uh, Northwestern and freshman chemistry, which is one of the most beautiful features of being in a chemistry lab, is you're in close contact with others that you don't know before. And his lab partner, who was this young woman, who was close to where his lab station was, got to be friends. And her name was, oh, what was her name? Well, Miss Hall. No, not Hall. Um, what lab did he work? Oh, I know, Griffiths. Oh, yeah. I don't know if, you, if you're, you've been around long enough to have heard of Griffith Laboratories in Chicago. But it was the, the Dow chemical of its day. But they were focused on pharmaceuticals. And when it came time to graduate, she influenced her father to hire uh, Lloyd Hall. He didn't go there right away, but they became acquainted. And so by the early 1920s, he was a chemist at Griffiths. And he became focused on developing pharmaceuticals. And uh, he stayed there till he retired. He, he was retired as uh, vice president, technical director, and 100 patents. I, I'm just doing that to reference him to my father and the way things were done in their day. My, now, Hall was born in 1994. And my father was born in 1904. And one of the practices of anybody that's in a minority culture is they get to know other people in that culture, no matter what that culture was. And it turned out Hall was the go-to guy, or one of the go-to guys, because our dad was looking for a job, and there were not many to be had in the Depression. And it wasn't that he necessarily was able to give him a job, but it was, come, let us talk. And so that's what he did. And a lot of things came out of, come, let us talk. He, people carpooled very often to out of California when they had to go to eastern locations. And he knew of, uh, he had a friend named Roy Spencer. Uh, they were from a prominent LA black family. Roy Spencer's sister was Vano Spencer. She became the first uh, black female judge in California. These people were born like around 1910 to 15. So he wanted to go to Chicago for a purpose. And he had a friend uh, named Luther Scott who was going to Detroit to buy a new car at the factory. And, and uh, so they all three got together in this car. There were no interstate expressways then or roadside stops. But anyway, they got across, they stopped in my father's ancestral town in Topeka, Kansas, and in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. He got to see some of his elderly aunts and uncles. Um, but they did what we call storytelling on the way. And these three guys all got to know each other uh, along the way. And, and real affection developed among the three of them. Well, on the way back, my father, I mean, uh, Luther, let uh, loose the, uh, the uh, fact that, oh, you should look up my sister. She she's works at Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company, which is where my father was working as an insurance sales agent. So anyway, he got acquainted with her when he got back. They got married three years later, <laughs> and, and then they had children. 
And so I was the first child. Um, and so I'm Grant D. Venerable II. This is Linda Blaine Venerable, second child, and Lloyd Dennis Venerable, third child. Okay, I, I yield the floor. To <laughs> Shall I start with Lloyd? Hold on one second. I just yeah. want to, I know Thomas has to step away. And so I wanted to, you brought up a lot of things in there that I th think that can help us bring more people to the conversation. Um, if there's someone in one of the vans that wants to talk about what happens when you're in close proximity, like driving across the country and getting to know people and building family, um, how that happens inside uh, the venerable house that can then um, maybe Linda would want to respond to. Does anyone have have a story they'd like to share with with the venerables about what that means? Well, well I was thinking back in that time, you know, when you guys were in the car together. Well. No, uh, well, when you explained it, I was thinking back in that time when you were in the car together, there probably wasn't a lot of stereos and radios and phone, so you had to talk. Ha, ah. <laughs> <laughs> ah. yeah. <laughs> An astute observation. <laughs> Come. Well. Come forward. OK. Mine is yours. Oh, yeah, I turned it off. That's okay. Oh, okay. Um, I think we recently went to like a diner, like restaurant. Did you give your name? Oh, my name's Angie. Angie? Yes. Okay. Uh, we went to like a diner or a restaurant type of thing, and we were like in the car. Even if we were like playing music, we were like still talking, like catching up, like asking random questions. So I think that's like how you connect. You just start asking random questions and see if like people like relate or don't relate, and you like learn about them, so I think that like connects in a way. Well, I've got a question for, for, for you saying that and, and everyone here. You are all from what is now Venerable Residence? And did all of you, or at least some of you, help decide that our father would be the one as opposed to somebody else? That's how that worked? Yeah, okay, okay. So having heard this, do you talk amongst yourselves when that process was going on? In other words, somehow you came to that venerable name and it became the, the name, right? Um, what were those conversations like? Because I think, I think if I could hear some of what you feel, you know, 2023 ideas, uh, will we'll kind of help um, to, to build a bridge, for, for me at least. Okay. Yeah. Give your name. I'm Emily. Okay. <clears throat> Introduce yourself. Emily? Emily? Hi, I'm yeah. Emily. Okay. Yes, I'm a senior. Um, actually, the president before me actually had a lot more to do with the renaming than I did. I kind of was in the role of, hmm. I kind of saw it happen as a freshman, sophomore, um, <clears throat> more than like, being the one to lead the process, but I think something that was very um, important to Aditi and like the renaming committee, and mm -hmm. especially on the student side, is to have somebody who will, um, <clears throat> sorry, sorry, who will be representative of our like inclusivity and the diversity we have in the house. Um, something that like we just went through rotation, which is a process that all of the first years get assigned to a house and. Mm -hmm. um, during the process, something that I would always talk about, about why I love Venerable House, is that we have such different interests and we have such a diversity in our students yeah. and everyone has somebody that hopefully they can like talk to about their interests and they'll like talk about it. Like I really like doing a lot of art and like crocheting okay. and yeah. like mm -hmm. I could talk to honestly almost anyone in the house right now and just like stand them up during the, like while I'm walking through the hallway while they're probably working on a set and like disturb their work and be like, oh my gosh, look at this product I've been working on and like basically talk yeah. about it for hours and they'll listen and they'll be excited for me. Um, and I think that's something that 
probably was highlighted in. Okay. Um, well, I, I know that my father would be, would fit in. He would like that characterization of diversity very easily. It would be good, good for him. Um, as you did it, were you curious though? Where did he come from? Who is he? In yeah. other words, <laughs> you know, kind of like, who are we? Right. I think we were super curious. I think at least I was really curious. We, yeah. um, the seniors this year, um, did our online, did our first year online. Mm -hmm. And so the introduction to the name change was also online. And it was really cool being able to see you last year and hear yeah. about your stories and everything. Did you, did you have a, a timeline, a history of him at all? Because I get the feeling that that's what maybe wants to happen right now. Yeah. Like I, him being born in Missouri, for instance. Yeah, I don't. Taken to California at 15 years old, going yeah. to high school in San Bernardino, and Santa Ana JC, and UCLA, and Cal Berkeley, and UCLA. <laughs> and, and finally here, you know, so what, what I'm wanting to do is get, you know, give a sense of the man, you know, and for me, it was long coming, you know, being the, the youngest and the last, you know, I was left out of the loop. So I'm kind of like you guys. And, and so um, <laughs> I'm about to lose my thought here. So yeah, he did this, and I think maybe a lot of a lot of you may identify with what was going on with him. You're you're in college, you're studying, you've got a goal. His mother had a goal for him, and that goal was, you know, move upward. You know, here's a black man who needs to do well, and 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 identify as having done well, right? So she said, you must be a doctor, an MD. And so um, that's why all these schools, he didn't want to be an MD. And so I don't know if you've had that challenge of parents. We parents, I happen to be a parents too, who we know best. So, <laughs> so you see, he had difficulty looking at his mom and saying no. And when he did, he somehow got to Caltech. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it like that for now because there is more. <laughs> yeah. I think we would love to hear about his story. Yeah, okay. I can, what I brought with me, because I, I kind of wanted to, um, he used this very, very short article as an introduction to Grant Venerable uh, at the Caltech campus in 1932. And it will give you some idea, and it, it certainly, it hit me because I always wondered, what, I, I, I had this curiosity about so many different subjects. I just couldn't pinpoint what I wanted after I read this which was written in 1932, I said, oh, <laughs> aha, <laughs> that sounds like me. <laughs> so this is an article called Student Expressions from the California Eagle, uh, October 1932. It's, it's not a, a long article. Grant D. Venerable, in the fact known and appreciated that at the world famous California Institute of Technology, Located in Pasadena, one and only one Negro student has ever studied within its sacred walls. It is the fact known and appreciated that this senior, for such he is, will be graduated from the school this year, having established a precedent hitherto unknown in the 20 or more years of its history. Grant D. Venerable deserves the highest respect and admiration of his fellows. The world greets intellectual accomplishments. Let colored folk get into this reception line and honor real achievement when it makes its appearance. The example of Mr. Venerable will encourage 
Negro youth, and I'll add all youth, throughout the land. It must do more. It must awaken a desire and determination to follow in the footsteps of this exemplary young man and student. Grant Venerable was born in Kansas City, Missouri, July 10th, 1904. Came to California a few years ago with his mother, Mrs. Louise Venerable, who lives presently in Los Angeles. Young Grant graduated from the San Bernardino High School, immediately planned to enter Caltech. He found himself, however, at UCLA as a medical student. Mm -hmm. This course was abandoned after three years, and the brilliant young mathematician headed straight for the Pasadena Institute, made famous by Millikan, Morgan, and Einstein. And Einstein was here at that time. He began his training for civil engineering and is soon to complete the course. Venerable soon won the esteem of professors and students. He was chosen vice president of the Cosmopolitan Club. He was sent by the school to the Canadian Student Christian Conference, which convened at Vancouver, British Columbia. And this past summer, delegates from all over the world were present. One day, Grant was casually led to enumerate a few subjects he had studied during his young career. The list is partly as follows. This is what grabbed me. Elementary and advanced algebra. I was good at that. <laughs> Plain and solid geometry. Trigonometry. Plain analytic and solid analytic geometry. Teach me, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Integral and differential calculus. I aced my differential calculus. <laughs> projection geometry. Projection geometry? Projected. No, it says projection geometry, brother. <laughs> Spherical trigonometry, and so forth and so on. Physics, chemistry, geology, zoology, paleontology, economics, history, Spanish, French, English, and a few others helped to make the list varied and interesting. I was confused. I was like, he's teaching us all of this in a way that was very, very easy. He read to us a lot. As so proceeds the career of a pioneer who not only on one occasion at Caltech received one of the two highest grades, but who was picked by coach and athletes as sheer quarterback and quarter mile material. As a twist of fate altered his career from that of phys physician to an engineer, so a twist of an ankle changed his career as an athlete, at least for a while. Soon the California Institute of Technology will open its doors and send forth another group of graduated science, scientists and engineers. Among them will be the first Negro in the history of the school, Grant D. Venerable. But that gives you an idea of the type of intellect that he had. And even though, you know, here we are present in the house, I was so unaware of this until a couple of years ago, and my jaw just dropped. Because I'm saying, oh, good grief. As my brother was saying, you know, it, back in, in the day, when we were in cars, and we had no phones, no radio, just our voices, and so we're sharing. But as little kids, we used to play the license plate game you know, uh, add the numbers? What can you make out of the letters? What words can you come up to? You were always looking out the windows. You were never looking. Okay. I mean, that, that was the most joyful thing because we were always on the road. We came up in an age where we watched freeways being constructed. 
I, I never understood. I, I have a daughter who's trying to find me. Um, I, I never understood how my father got from point A to point B in his car. But I just kept watching. And I love maps to this day. And anywhere I go, if I go once, I can get back. I'm going to turn it over to my brother because I think I have a desperate child. <laughs> Could you excuse me, please? <laughs> Lord, take over. Oh, yeah? Yes, please. I never rode I in a to. car that didn't have a radio. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, what, you, you want to ask her? Oh, so you're just yeah. sitting there all happy? Oh, yeah, 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 I'm happy to ask. Name? Oh, it's, I'm Marcos. <laughs> oh, I can hear it. Is it working? Yeah, I'm Marcos. I'm a current undergraduate who's a member of and lives in uh, Venerable House. Um, I guess one of the things I wanted to ask, uh, because when we were picking the name uh, years ago, we, we had first heard of, uh, one of the first places a lot of us heard of it was, or have heard of the name Venerable was from a group of uh, graduate students that were selecting names for, uh, for um, some of the buildings around campus, including our residents. And uh, Venerable is one of the early favorites. And we, um, uh, I'm sure a lot of us of, who are currently living there are wondering just uh, what uh, Grant Venerable was like to talk to and spend time with, and certainly to yeah. be raised by. Yeah. Let me ask you first, why was he an early favorite? What put him out there? Well, um, other than his trailblazing status for other students of color that would uh, come to the institute and uh, later thrive here, uh, we read stories about um, his, um, uh, from uh, the brief things we were able to find online about, uh, for example, like examples of his tenacity and his, um, his uh, interactions with the Institute and being able to um, uh, push through adversity that he had faced yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, you know, I, I think it's probably uh, important and, and very real to, to know that, you know, he, like everyone in here, first is a human being. And um, that's how I knew him, as a, as a human being who happened to be my father. And um, Caltech was very abstract in my life. So um, my father um, did a lot of things that everyone was doing now and then. We did them in different ways, of course. And I mean, if he had a cell phone, or if we handed him one today, he'd probably be a little bit, uh, you know, questioning what's this about and why do you need it, kind of thing. But the, I think I think what I what I want to let you know is that um, uh, my father, my father and I, generally, we were very much alike in the in the everyday world. Um, he came here, he studied, he got a piece of paper that said go out, be a civil engineer. And for all intensive purposes, he didn't become a civil engineer. And that grabbed me after a while, you know. What happened? Well, it was 1932, 33, depression's ending, et cetera. And as my brother mentioned, yeah, he, he met our mother and, you know, had three kids. So you gotta, you gotta feed them. And um, because the market did not let him in and other, other factors. My father did sell, sell insurance, but he needed more and he wanted to keep up with his friends who did finish school and became doctors, lawyers, and, and, and various people. And, and um, he made a decision. He bought a manufacturing company. And for, I think, everyone in here, what, what really intrigues me most is that, you know, we have all this electronics and every one of you can pick up your phone and get information, solve problems, etc. My father's company manufactured chalkboard erasers. Yeah. And <laughs> We were the crew. <laughs> um, it, was, it was a bid item. 
So this little eraser, which when I went to elementary school, junior high school, not so much high school, was our toy in those schools and we threw them at each other and it was an honor to be chosen in elementary to go out and pound on them like that and clean the board. And at the same time, from nine years old onward, we were making erasers. And it was, it was we, we had everything we needed, you know, food, comfort, etc. But I kept wondering, you know, what was it that made him who he was as his friends, who we were often in contact with, um, did become the, the doctor or the, the whatever profession they wanted and climbed and did well. And my father used to say, you know, he's got to keep his pencil, pencil sharp because of this bid item. So in LA, he could win the bid for the LA City School System, and it kept us inside, at least me, I cared. <laughs> I was inside making erasers as opposed to being out playing with my friends during summer. And, and uh, it was kind of the bane of me, but he could win that bid, and he would sell erasers to the LA City School System at least two times a year, if not three times a year, you know, tune of 80, 80 gross each, each sale. And um, he could sometimes win a bit as far away as St. Saint, Saint Louis. But at that point, he couldn't do it because there were huge companies back there who sold hundreds of items for the school systems. And um, he was very steadfast. And in doing what he did, it said something to me later in life. He set up his operation, which, by the way, had machinery. You know, he wasn't doing any of this. And he had machinery, I don't know if you know, but that had what were called flywheels that were, you know, as high as, not the window quite, but went around and machines coming down, making noise and cutting felt, you know, from like big rolls all the way down to get this thing done. So, um, it was hard work. It was uh, kind of unkind work, and my sister was in there doing it with us, you know, kind of thing. But what I'm wanting to get across is that um, he did, and he had to do what he had to do to keep us okay and even safe in there, but to watch us grow, get through school, and do what he himself did not do, even though he made the effort, got to the finish line at Caltech, but did not get to reap the benefit of his passion. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it like that um, and try to create an, an, an image, a characterization that might be helpful for Venerable House you know, students. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Oh, uh, did, I... did you have a question, Laura? Oh, uh, um, what are some fond memories you have of, uh, of, of your father? Well, you know, we're, you know, we're talking about fond, fond memories. Actually, mine were a little bit different, you know, because I was the only little bit of estrogen in the whole wow. I mean, I, I grew up in, in a household of, of pure, <laughs> it was different. My father was kind of scared. He really was. How, how the heck do I raise a female? <laughs> and here are two males. And, and he finally came to the conclusion, she can do the same thing they're doing. I mean, they learned how to change the oil, change the tires, you know, fix the car, you know, do plumbing. Do this. Come on, Linda. You can do it too. I, I did. And actually, I'm very thankful. Saves a lot of money. <laughs> but <laughs> I have a daughter yeah. who was trying to find her way. And well. I kept saying, okay, I'm, oh, she's out there. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. This is this is the granddaughter and great granddaughter of Grant Venerable. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, Welcome. My grandson-in-law. Yes, you got here. <laughs> you got here. We made it. I'm so glad. Hey there, Nisi. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. A little late, but... Okay, go find a seat. Actually, I want to just ask a question, if I can, since well, we have multi-generations here and it was something that we were talking about um, both on Tuesday and earlier that I don't know if the students know and I hope you guys can talk about it but your mom passed away when you were small yes. and yeah, your dad yeah it was that yeah, situation right yeah. um, not only was this intellect but a parent of uh, and both a mother and a father for, for all of you and made choices around what it meant to keep you together right. um, mm -hmm. as siblings. And so right. maybe you can talk a little bit about that, about sacrifice and tenacity and love right. um, and how right. you know he really was this incredible person, <laughs> especially of the, at the time that he right. made these choices for right. his children right. that really informed who you guys are and who he became as a man. Right. He, um, he, he was the typical, I'd, I'd say, parent of the day when uh, our mother was alive. I was six, five, and eight when she passed away. And it was very sudden. And, uh, and as I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, to, to say a lot because I, I said way too much last year, uh, but it threw him for a loop. And because the fathers, of the 40s and 50s were very, very different. It was that June Cleaver kind of thing. You know, mom was up there in, now my mother did not wear high heel shoes to do the vacuuming. <laughs> but she was there taking care of three children. She was cooking. She had a fabulous garden that she shared with the, the next door neighbor. I mean, we love to get our hands dirty. And um, she, she sewed so beautifully. You know, she was just this, this, this person who, I, I mean, I can remember, and there, there are not too many things I can remember because I was so young. When she went out, the women of that day dressed, hat, gloves, coat, chinchilla wrap. <laughs> she was sharp as a tack. She was gorgeous. And when she walked in high heels, I could hear this click, click, click of her heels. And I always wanted to sound that way when I finally wore heels. That is the one thing that was so profound that I remember. She was a gorgeous woman. So when she was gone, uh, our father was just like, what do I do with three kids? Well, we had friends, you know, you know, they offered, I'll, I'll take the girl. Here, I'll take a guy, I'll take a guy. My mother's last words were, keep the children together, raise them. And he was true to that. He said, I've got to figure this out somehow. He had so many friends, I mean, friendships galore, where he could call on the wives of these friends. I don't know what to do about my daughter. Well, I went to, to, to the Boy Scouts. I, I went to Cub Scouts. I went to Boy Scouts. I've been to many jamborees. <laughs> many. I just couldn't go to Boy Scout camp. Otherwise, I would have been there too. But he, he made that decision. I will raise these children. And it's something which probably your parents, the students here, have you know had input from both parents and and you know fathers who may have fully participated in, in changing and, and, and feeding and all that kind of thing that was unheard of in the 50s you know daddy went out to work he came home sat down he read the paper 
He talked a little bit. He read us books. That was it. Repeat the next day. We went on little vacations in all the canyons that are right behind you. I can remember those times. Um, there is a canyon up here, Millard Canyon. Uh, if you've never heard of it, I think it's, it's still there. But we would go there and climb on the rocks. Those are really, really fun memories. Things became very muddled when my mother died. Because it was, how do you continue this when that one person in your life is missing? And these children are missing that female part. That was so difficult, so difficult. And for me, it was, OK, that Christmas, we would go see Santa Claus. And Santa Claus, well, what do you want, little girl? I want my mommy. That went on for a good year. Uh, and, and somewhere in there, sometime in there, it, it hit me, I guess it's not going to happen. I need to accept this. And a, a father who, at first, you know, he, he was hurting so badly, and he had to bring himself into the present so that he could help to make sense of this whole thing for all three of us, because we were all suffering in different ways. <laughs> but it takes a man of such extraordinary character to make a decision to say, and, and when all his male friends were saying, put the kids in school, send them to boarding school, so you can do what you want to do. And he would finally say, what I want to do is raise my children. Let me um, amplify. Yes. Now, partly, also in that equation was my father's saintly sister, our Aunt Neosho, named after the Neosho River in Kansas and Missouri. She was a highly educated woman, one of the first of her color in the, the state of Missouri. But she was, she was about 10 years, 11 years older than our father. And uh, she did so well in high school, she went to the segregated black high school in Kansas City, Missouri, which was presided over by a man who later became president of Florida A&M University and built it to what it became today. But she was awarded, which was the tradition, uh, a state scholarship to leave the state. <laughs> so, but don't, don't come here to Missouri, to the, our University of Missouri. So she did what so many uh, black young people did. They went next door to Kansas, to Kansas University, which wasn't perfect, and, but they were doing something very different from University of Missouri and the rest of the, the border south and the south. But um, dad wasn't perfect either. And uh, that's a fact of life. Sometimes we lose sight of that in school when we're young. Do I have to be perfect? No, you have to try to be. But the other thing is after Mother's passing and Aunt Neosho came to live with us at intervals and cook the meals for us so that that mother uh, presence would continue until my father got his feet on the ground and he eventually remarried a few years later. But one thing that came out of that was my unwittingly asking our, our housekeeper, who also came, to help us out. Because when she would butter the toast, I'd say, oh, I want to help you. <laughs> and she said, no, no, I'm afraid you'll put too much butter on the toast. But that led to a conversation, a strategic session between our dad and Aunt Neosho. At that point, from then on, we were all taking care of the house. <laughs> Boys, too. <laughs> Making the bread, the beds, mopping the floors, dusting the furniture, washing the dishes, washing the clothes. We didn't have automatic washing machines no. <laughs> or dryers. 
They went up on the clothesline with clothespins. So that, that was the fun we had. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I have to comment as well on some of those little things that, that we used to do that grew out of um, our father's um, uh, communication skills. There. Because I, I don't know how he find out, found out so many people's birthdays, but he always sent cards. He, he was always communicating in written communication. And one of the things that he taught us was at Christmas time, we had this big routine because he always sent cards. Now those were the days that Chris, well, you could, you could send something for maybe two cents. So he, now the original contacts, you know what your contacts is, cell phone, you got a cell phone contact? Yeah. He had three phone books full of names and information, handwritten. So at Christmas time, my brother had one book, I had one book, and my brother had another book. And I guess he started at A, and I may have started at G, and he must, or later, and maybe K over here. And we would write out the envelopes. We had an assembly line. <laughs> this is pure engineering. He developed a, um. an, a, a, an assembly line. So that we made out the cards, we wrote out the cards, printed until cursive, until we learned our cursive. Then we took the cards and we each signed our names. Then we had to stuff them. We could fold them in back in those days. We didn't have to seal them. And then we had the assembly line to put on the stamps. And then we had to separate them into in-state and out-of-state. Boom. It took maybe a week or two weeks. But that was every year. What do I do every year? I used to send all my cards out, too, until the stamps got to be 50 cents. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have my contacts in the phone. Uh, I send emails with my annual letters. And let me tell you, I can't be late. Because I have people who will send me an email, where's your letter? <laughs> <laughs> You're late. Yeah. But this started, what, 50 years, yeah. 60 years ago, with our father, seeing our father. And it wasn't just Christmas. He would do Thanksgiving cards. He would do Easter cards. <laughs> we did a lot of writing. But you see, it taught us another a, a, a form of communication that a lot of people don't appreciate today. And I want to give props to my daughter back there who last week said, do you have some thank you cards? And I brought a half dozen cards. She says, no, nah, I want to write a note. We're not talking a note that just says, hey, thank you for this. She wrote a note. Do you have a stamp? Yes. <laughs> Goes in there. So she is doing the same thing. So it's going on. This is the legacy of Grant Venerable, that communication and that written communication. And it's becoming a lost art these days because everybody says, oh, did you email me? <laughs> email me, please. And you know, there's, there's, there's no more of those nice little, little letters that you stick in an envelope and yeah. the, the other part of the communication is the, one of the bases of this meeting is it gave my father an opportunity to comment on the names that we were filling out. Those that weren't relatives were friends. And that's how we would find out who those people were that we saw in our lives, what they were doing, what they had achieved, but the relatives would lead to comments on ancestors. That was another little piece. That's one way we knew who our ancestors were way back in the early 1800s and before.
Yeah, thank you for sharing so much about um, wholesome family traditions and support uh, from other family members as well. I think you mentioned uh, Aunt uh, Neosha? Neosha. 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 Mm -hmm. Neosha. Okay, thank you for the correction. Yeah. Um, I think my former roommate, I think I saw your hand up. No, okay. <laughs> Uh, apologies, but the um, yeah. Thank you for so much. Thank you so much for uh, explaining a little bit more about um, the the man and father behind the name Grant Venerable. Um, uh, I guess just to go back to in a point uh, earlier in the storytelling uh, about uh, long road trips and getting acquainted with friends that way. Um, Members of Venerable House uh, regularly take a ski trip that is somewhat uh, subsidized by Caltech uh, to Mammoth. So it's uh, about a six hour ish drive from yeah. here to there each way. And um, we'll usually be playing music, but we also have uh, quite, uh, quite fond conversations, usually about anything we see or our lives in general. And uh, I've, I've gone pretty close to a lot of uh, current and former members of the house through trips like that. And uh, this can be great fun. And um, while you're mentioning the um, writing birthday cards for holidays, um, we um, this is actually surprisingly more of a, a more recent development. But when uh, we celebrate uh, our birthdays together in the house, uh, people usually uh, get together and write like handwritten cards. And when people are first introduced to the house, uh, we also do a similar, uh, not quite an assembly line. Uh, we don't have we haven't employed the ingenuity that perhaps we should, uh, but perhaps for future years. Uh, we will we'll usually um, write uh, welcoming messages for incoming uh, members of Venerable. Yeah. No, no postage involved for us. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, we usually physically hand it to them. We don't, don't usually. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, we don't have to. Yeah. It's a very good point. That's yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Would you like to come up? Yes, have um, come up. Thank you. Uh, um, so, my, oh, so my name is Delici. And my question is, um, how do you think uh, Venerable would feel seeing uh, the current state of like Caltech campus, the fact that there's a house named after him? And how do you guys feel about uh, the renaming that happened a couple years ago? And I guess Caltech's like attitude towards being like inviting you guys to speak and inviting to hear about your, more about your family and Ven uh, Venerable's background. I'll, I'll tell you, I was overwhelmed when my brother called and he told me. And I, 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 I probably just, I cried a Niagara Falls. I was just so overwhelmed. And I called each one of my children, one in Texas, one in Arizona, and at the time, well, no, I was with Michelle. And she's like, what's wrong, what's wrong? I said, oh, it's so right, it's so right. I said, I can't get over it. And, and you know, I'm, I'm just crying. I was, I was just bawling, that ugly cry. <laughs> and, and, and my older son was, mom, are you all right? Yes, yes, I'm all right. Why are you crying? Oh my God, let me tell you what Caltech did. And he said, what? I said, I gotta call your brother, bye. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my younger son is like, mom, are you okay? I said, oh, oh, mom, breathe, breathe. I said, oh, I'm just crying, I'm just crying. I said, I'm gonna be crying for days. I cannot believe this. And I called girlfriends. You know, girlfriends understand. You need your girlfriends. Said, oh, Caltech is doing this. And, and of course, they're asking all these questions about, oh, when is this going to happen? What are they going to do? Blah, blah. I don't know. I don't know. I said, I'll let you know. I'll let you know. And when we finally found out a little bit more about the ceremony that was going to take place, and, uh, and, and then they said, OK, they want you to speak. And I said, you know I like to talk. <laughs> um, and, and I started thinking about, what do I say? You know, what, and then brother says, I know what I'm going to say. I said, cool. Because <laughs> I knew it would be all the chemical equations that you understand. <laughs> and, and then brother says, who's the quiet one? He says, well, I think I can come up with something. I said, okay, good. I, I literally thought about it 
for about six months. That's, I never wrote anything down. I had friends who, who watched the speech, and they said, we didn't see you take any paper up there. I said, no. I said, it was right here. I said, it just came out. And I just hope that it came together. And apparently it did, <laughs> which I was so grateful for. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, overwhelmed that Caltech would even consider honoring this man who wanted to be here so badly, and then who pulled us into Caltech. I mean, we, we, we sat in, in your, your lecture halls. We were listening to lectures, didn't know what the heck they were talking about. There, there we were. But when you sit there and, and you really don't understand, you don't know, there is something that goes in here. And, and sometime in your life, something may come to the surface, like maybe something familiar. And it, 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 it works for you. Um, I have been able to call on, on Caltech in so many different ways. Uh, when I was at Cal State LA studying business administration, of which there may have been about 50 women in, of, of, among 5,000. In, in that particular course of study. Um, we just weren't studying that, but that came from my father. Um, because as, as Lloyd said, we worked at the factory. I did everything, know my tools. But then he had an accountant who would come in and he would, he would I'd, I'd never seen anybody do this. Here's this list of figures that's this long, and he would go and put down a, a balance. And I'd sit there like, but then he would show me what he was doing in office procedure and taxes. And I was 16. And so I started to learn business then. And it took me a while to get there, just like it took my father a while to get from Santa Ana JC to Caltech. <laughs> but I finally did, and I finally made up my mind to be in a course of business administration. And when we were asked to present a seminar and to present um, people who were in the industry, my father says, well, why don't you call up so-and-so? My classmate from Caltech and my classmate from, I had at least six gentlemen from Caltech at the table and professors with their jaws on the floor because I said, well, how did she do that? It was great seminar. What about um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Procter and Gamble? Mills. Mills. Hodges. Mills Hodge, Procter and Gamble. Do you know who Mills Hodge is? No, you probably don't. But <laughs> Mills Hodge was the uh, the general manager of Procter and Gamble Long Beach, where they made all of Procter and Gamble's toothpaste and other and so Tide cool. soap and all the other household items that people bought. There yeah. he was. Yeah. He was right there they to be smiling. counted. Then yeah. there was yes. Uncle George Schroeder. <laughs> See, we were calling them uncle <laughs> and aunt. But uh, we didn't know any difference racially. <laughs> so <laughs> Dad said, well, this is Uncle Roger. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> but where, where did that come from? It came out of his history. He and Aunt Yosho. That gets into ancestry. When, once you do your genealogy, you have to be prepared for some political incorrectness because the truth comes in very strange, unusual ways at times. But he had playmates in Odessa, Missouri, out in the country, 35 miles from Kansas City, where his grandma and step-grandpa lived. But he didn't know then at the time that it was really his step-grandpa. His grandpa lived next door, who was the, the neighbor of the colonel that owned his grandma. The great great grand, two of the great great grandchildren of the colonel came last year to the Olive Walk event. I had told her, the sister, about it, because she had given me so much information 
on the ancestors. But it was a, a tunnel into understanding. It's not all the way that you're told in the Hollywood productions. <laughs> they didn't whip all the slaves <laughs> or cut their hands off. Uh, but what was going on, uh, the kids, the kids of the, the owned used to play with the kids of the owners. And they didn't know no difference, that they were of different racial backgrounds. So he was used to kids that didn't look like him. And that was so crucial to getting through Caltech. If you sat up there waiting for, well, should I go ask this person to help me figure out this problem? He didn't even go through, he just asked. So they all formed camaraderies except one person, maybe a couple of people. And the one person was, which you heard about Tuesday, was one of the most famous graduates of Caltech, the co-inventor of the transistor. Who was that? Do you all happen to know? His name was William Shockley. Shockley came to Caltech not just to study physics. He came because they had a super duper organization called the Human Betterment Association, which is on the campus providing funds to Caltech to conduct the eugenics programs to eliminate the misfits of the earth. I'm saying that to say how history can flip on you. You may have one intention and it isn't right. History's going to flip on you at some point. And it got flipped. And then eugenics was out the door. Because it, it was getting ready to take over biology courses so that you wouldn't have had a biology department. You'd have had a eugenics department. But it turned into molecular biology and genetics. So that, that's about the most sensitive subject I could touch on right now. But my dad was in the middle of it because he flipped the faculty. By that I mean his personality, and, and some of you had asked about that. What was it like? He was genuinely disarming. You went into his presence, something inside of you made you feel good to be alive. And you were, you know, you felt that way in this man's presence. And so people were just, I'd say 90% of them, just very warm and receptive. Couldn't have got through Caltech without that. And if you want to know how he would feel about all of the Vins that are here, he would embrace all of you. He would be so proud to know, just, just to look out and see all of these faces who are just, you know, you're trying to get through this system and trying to understand the system and trying to keep on growing up a little bit more and a little bit more. He would have just loved to come here and, and go to Ben House and just share with you because you would keep him going all night long. He would, he would stick with you and just talk and answer questions and he would be proud. That, I mean, because that would be family. That's family. You guys are family. Proud, proud, proud to share Vins with you. Because you know, that's, Venerable is, is, is not a common name. And it, it was actually a mistake that, <laughs> that was made a couple hundred years ago because it was Venable. And someone was writing something down and added ER, oh well. <laughs> I accept. <laughs> yeah. Those Venables of Virginia were prominent Southerners, and, but they were also prominent academics, like the president of the University of North Carolina in the uh, late 1890s, early 1900s, also founded Union Carbide Corporation based on one of his inventions. But 
you, you have, the Venables had their own children, <laughs> but they had many servants in bondage who had children too. And if, if the atmosphere was halfway distant, decent, everybody's children absorbed the values in that family's history and activities. So all of us really inherited a lot of that venerable cultural heritage of higher education, chemistry, mathematics, art, humanities. Yeah. So I will, I will add that very true, very true. Um, <laughs> the group that's here really represents what I saw growing up people coming through our house all the time. Um, social economic differences from here to here, you know, colors, languages. They also went to his factory, which was, you know, just a, a, a uh, what you call a neighborhood shop. No air conditioning, nothing, nothing that was very uh, comfortable in there, but people would seek him out. And I found it very interesting who would seek him out and who was he talking to today. They'd come to his house, they'd go in the den and they're talking and I'm saying, who is it? So yeah, it was pretty much not just family, but um, his friends from Caltech, you know. He had uh, people who were in music, religion, and yes, art, <laughs> which would be people I tend to attract. Um, around all the time. So he would be extremely proud. He'd come here and fit in it very comfortably. You'd see a guy perhaps who would be looking a little aged, but it wouldn't matter. He, as, as my sister just said, he wouldn't be able to leave you alone. He'd want to know, what are you doing? How are you doing it? Are you okay? That type of thing. He was, he was you know, a guy. Johnny Poole, for example. Oh, Mr. Poole. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of these people were real characters, too. And, 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 and they, they helped him. People wanted to sit there and do this, this you know, treacherous hand operation to make these little erasers. And, and this, I will say, Johnny Poole, he was a, uh, quite the genius with metals. And he, his garage, wall to wall to the ceiling with tools. And he would go down and have fun in the factory. I didn't have fun. We didn't have fun. <laughs> but he'd come in there, and I say this because, you know, he was a white guy. He was 100 years old then. And he, you know, had a pipe in his mouth. And he'd chew on this pipe, and he, he had his own language. I didn't, we didn't really know his language. And he'd just chew on it, and he'd come in there, yeah, like that, you know. And I thought he was the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> you know, so he'd walk down two blocks to his house and he'd make some little something that big and walk back and put it into a machine so that machine, a little oil, would work. And um, I always enjoyed my house because I never knew who was going to show up. <laughs> you know, so yeah, he would, he would be extremely comfortable and proud to see his name on that, on that wall. Yeah. Yeah. Was, was Mr. Cole the one who, who, who taught him how to drive with his bow feet? <laughs> no, it, it, it was. It was, yeah. yeah my, was, father, okay. my father, you know, if you do stick, you know, you got your clutch. And as they got modern, you didn't need a clutch. And he showed him how it would be a good idea to use both feet. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know, I mean, it, it really, there's something to it. Let's face it, you don't mm -hmm. have to be doing that kind of thing. So yeah, people were characters. They really were in, in many ways, and I, um, I, I like that part of life. Yeah. 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 Mr. Yeah. Poole was one of those, he said, well, what's your left foot doing just sitting there? <laughs> Put it to work. <laughs> And so my father learned how to drive an automatic with both feet, you know, brake, accelerator. So when I learned how to drive, and to this day, and I can, 
Oh, yes, dear. Does Lloyd do it? I don't know. Who knows? I do it. <laughs> Well, and I, I can, and, and I can drive does. a stick ship. My brain mm -hmm. just shifts. You know, it's people, look, this is the funny thing about people, about humans <laughs> and, and the brain. The brain allows you to do anything you want to do. You can do anything you want to do. You just got to say, I want to do that. Because I, everybody said, well, you can't do that. Won't you get a ticket for doing that? I said, how's, 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 how's Cap going to know I'm doing that? I, 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 I do this all the time. And, and, and someone said, well, you're a dangerous driver. And I said, prove it. <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was the one thing. Oh, Mr. Poole, you come around. Yeah, the type. And he, and he, he did the, the um, wood carving as well. Oh my God. But yeah, this, this is one of the things, one of the, the characters in his life. I mean, there were so many people who came through the factory and, and some would work for him. You know, a lot of younger guys who were trying to get their lives straight. Um, and I, there's this one and I, every now and then when I want a good laugh, he, he was a young guy. And he, he just wanted to work at Ronald. And my father would say something, and he'd say, great googa mooga. <laughs> and I, 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 he had me rolling. Everything that came out of his mouth, I'm rolling. I had, I had to just get my act together so I could do work, actual work. But he was hilarious, and sometimes I do wonder, you know, what happened to some of these young people who came through that factory, you know, and, and trying to get their lives straightened out, trying to get onto a, a path that was viable and productive for them. But yeah, some real characters. Um, and I just want to ask, um, so I feel as though, let's say like a freshman walks in or, um, <coughs> other houses who aren't, you know, in Venerable House. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people, the history they know about Grant Venerable is he was the first African American to graduate from Caltech. Mm -hmm. So if you guys could say, like, so besides like the main thing he's known for by people who haven't taken the time to learn about the actual history, um, what would you guys want maybe like the one sentence that would come after that or be attached to that or instead of that? Um, that someone would tell someone who's never heard of Venerable before, a uh, freshman who's just now come on campus, like just like another sentence of what, like, um, and what's more to Grant Venerable. Wow. Do you want to speak to that? Huh. Do you want to speak to that? Did you get all? Well, There's, I don't. Well, I, I didn't yeah. quite get all of that. Oh. <laughs> so I guess the main question was like, if you could pick another sentence oh, besides oh. he was the first African American to graduate from Caltech, like if there was something else you would add to that, like one sentence more to tell anyone who doesn't already know who Venerable is, after they say that, what more, like, what else, what would be the best thing someone could add to really show who Venerable was? You know, I, I, I mean, I think my father was a very creative person. And, and I mean, if you, whatever you're doing, he would probably find a way to do it a little bit better. <laughs> and um, to his detriment, yeah. that's what he did with his product. And when I, you know, gave up my, my craziness of having to work in there as a child, went back and helped him as an adult, I realized and I said to him, you're making this eraser too good. <laughs> and that was his pride point. This eraser's been on his chalkboard and he would collect them. They'd, they'd erase and come down in size to like that and he was, his pride was all over it. And I realized he was the only one in the country gluing his erasers top to bottom. Mm -hmm. So they lasted. Everyone else was stitching them, sewing them. So they came apart. So he probably could have been selling LA City schools, 160 gross every time they ordered kind of thing, you know? So that and, and is, is something I know that I carry. I mean, I, I tend to do that. But I realized the other day something which, which grabbed me about him. 
is that having these kids, you know, uh, he lost his wife and his mother, by the way, a month or two before his wife. And so he had all of this on him. He became a, a part of what happened in each school. And they asked him to be PTA president in Manual, Manual in high school. And so he thought about it. And people said, you can't do that, that you, you, women do that. <coughs> and he said, no, I'm going to do it. And instead of PTA, he put an S in the front of it, student, parent, teacher association, instead of just. So he included the students and invited them to the meetings and to get involved. So I really, for me, I really, I really take that as being much more than what it might sound like, you know, because convention was, he was not about convention unless it was perhaps in academic where you needed to know what came first to get to where you're going. So Lisa, Lisa, yeah? when we uh, tested our uh, DNA, we discovered through the male sons, his father's son line goes back to a common ancestor in the uh, linguistic region of, well, from Ghana to Nigeria. Uh, I'm not, tw tw tra what is it, three, the three people in Ghana. But that his base ancestor, male ancestor, was that African individual from West Africa. But to answer, it goes direct to your question. What he presented to Caltech was not just being the first African descended human being here, but he was really the first truly cross-disciplinary, cross-cultural, comprehensive, critical thinker that crossed, as I said, disciplinary. It wasn't just good critical thinking in science and engineering. It was bringing all those things together with the humanities and the sociology that keeps a civilization functioning. So that's really what he was, which included religion, by the way. But. So you'd add like that he's a creative, critical thinker who could bridge different communities and represented yeah, a lot of cross disciplines. A lot of cross, cross disciplines. cultures. Yeah. Well, he was a musician. Wow. I mean, he, he sang. He sang he in his cornet. churches. He mm -hmm. he played cornet in the high school bands and the college bands, and he could make sure his kids practiced the piano properly. He was a father, a critical thinker, and a cross-disciplinary scholar. Now, now critical, that's the, that's the difficult word for people to grasp, because most people in the Congress think that means judging, criticizing, putting down someone, and it doesn't. It means a application of the Talmudic approach. The Talmud, which goes back to Hebrew rabbis who developed a methodology and because every 50 years they'd look at the scriptures and decided if the interpretation was proper or did it need upgrading. It's still going on now. But that was the spirit in the Reformation after the Renaissance that went into Northern Europe and it transformed alchemy into science and chemistry and physics and engineering. So anyway, I don't know. <laughs> you can say you heard it in any classes. Thank you so much. That really helps in being able to, you know, um, for anyone who can like walk away from today, we're, we're obviously not always able to explain the entire life of someone so great and complex like to the average freshman or the average person who has a set to go work on. Um, so being able to walk away uh, saying like, at least from you know, the family themselves, this is who, this is how Venerable would like to be remembered. This is who he was past right. just 
oh, yes, he graduated from here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think that's a beautiful way to end the conversation. <laughs> One of the things that we wanted to do um, today, I hope, is to invite the students to leave comments for the record about what it is to be a Venn, uh, which I know it's getting late, but if you guys want to, you can grab a microphone and work with them. The AV, do they still call you AV? I, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm showing how old I am. Um, but that you guys could, I hope, leave, leave your thoughts on the record so that future generations of Caltech students and future VENs can, can access them in the archive and also so that the venerable family can access them too and be inspired by how much you're inspired by their father. So I hope you guys can do that today. And thank you for thank coming. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, being a Ven means never being afraid to be authentic or fully yourself. Thank you. Venerable to me means community and support and a family wherever you look. They're always watching out for you, always making sure you're okay, and passing down the favor to generations beyond. To me, Ven being, means being part of a family. Yeah? <laughs> Should I do it again? <laughs> yeah, do it again. Okay. <laughs> to me, being a Ven means being part of a family. Hi, I just wanted to say that for me, being a Ven means having a home away from home and being part of a family away from my family. <laughs> to me, Venerable is all about community. We truly are a family. Uh, there's always people, or sorry, can I start over? Venerable to me is all about community. You always find really authentic people in the house. People always take care of each other and it truly is like a family away from your actual family. Being a vent to me is being there for other people, be, trying to make a difference and trying to make an impact on other people's lives in the best way possible. I think to me, Venerable is a family where anyone is welcome and can be whoever they truly are. <laughs> yeah, my name is Haywood Robinson, BS class of 1974. I just want to thank the Venerable family for coming and sharing this evening. Uh, I'm also from South Central, didn't realize that we grew up no more than five, six miles from each other. It's wonderful, South Central has many places. I'm from Jefferson High and we know the league. So I just want to say what inspires me most about your family is not only is the greatness of your patriarch, but there's an interesting combination of enormous pride and enormous humility that's going to pass down through your family. God blesses y'all a whole, whole bunch. To be a Ven is to, I guess, find community in a lot of different situations, to stay up from like 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. studying with other people and having fun with other people and getting close to other people and ruining your sleep schedule along the way. Um, so for me, I think being a Ven just means like having a sense of like home and a community. Like the thing that I like the most about Ven is like an incoming freshman um, was that how like at home everyone makes you feel. And I think that like Ven is a place where like you can always be seen for who you are. And I, I think that that's something that also Venerable did for other people in his community. And I like that that's something that we still do for each other today. Being a part of Venerable House is just being a person, first and foremost, and being a person who enjoys um, listening to other people and learning about anything and everything about other people and what people are interested in. And it's really just a great community, even for the few weeks that I've been here. So we love Venerable. 
To me, being in Venn means joining a really amazing community where we embrace not only our similarities, but also our differences, and really celebrating everyone's cultures and just having fun. Something I would say about Venerable is uh, how they're very, they're very open to like, getting to know you like, and not like, trying to make you someone that you're not and like, open to like, um, like, p bring you to your thin and they're to like, family and like, get to know other people and like, learn like, what other people want to do and like, like, balance off of them and like, just meet new people and be open-minded. I think being a Ven uh, is something special because there's uh, there's such a rich diversity of oh there's such a rich diversity of people uh, at Venerable. Uh, I think unlike a lot of other houses I felt uh, on campus, Venerable doesn't have any kind of cliques or groups where that are restricted for only certain kinds of people. Everyone here is welcome. No one here has to pick one group to be a part of. Uh, there's so much freedom and there's so much diversity. Uh, I think that's one of the greatest gifts that uh, Grantee Venerable has left for Venerable House. Uh, and I think I'll always be thankful for that for my next four years here. So what I like most about uh, being a Ven is that I'm able to be my true and authentic self and not always have to like put on a mask when I'm around other people. And that allows me to pursue my goals and my dreams like to my full extent and have a really good you know, supporting cast around me. And at the same time, I'm able to um, help others with their goals. So being a Ven is really just about being your authentic self and just embracing the whole community around you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So this is June Edmonds. She's the artist who's doing the portrait at the Venerable House. And I'm so honored to be doing this portrait at the Venerable House. This has just been such an amazing process to witness from the Venerables being here and the students that were here to get the name, that were present for the name change, have been here the whole time. I, I just think it's such an important uh, project and you guys just have so much wonderful documentation to go with the project, thanks to Jilly. So um, it's an honor to be a part of this. Yeah.